Hello, my name is Shiri Orion. I am the executive director of the American Friends of the Parent Circle. If this is your first time joining us, um, the Parent Circle Families Forum is an organization made up of 600 bereaved families, Israelis and Palestinians, all of whom lost a loved one to the conflict and all of who have chosen a path of reconciliation rather than revenge. And they share their stories with Israelis and Palestinians <clears throat> and people all over the world to inspire hope and to show people that there is another way, that war is not an act of fate and that we should see each other as human beings first and foremost. We have two members of the parent circle joining us here today and our very special guest, Ambassador Tom Nides. Hello, Ambassador. Thank you for joining us. We're so privileged and honored to have you here with us today. Um, for those of you just joining, Ambassador Nides, I'm going to read your bio very quickly. Um, ambassador Nides was confirmed as a U.S. Ambassador to Israel in November 2021. Um, he was most recently the managing director and vice chairman of Morgan Stanley. He is a distinguished public servant, as well as a business leader. Um, Ambassador Nides was the U.S. State Department's deputy secretary of state for management and resources from 2010 to 2013. And he is the recipient of the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award. And also importantly, he is a friend of the parent circles and we are um, very happy to have you here with us today. Um, Bassam Aramin is joining us from Jericho, Ramadan Karim Bassam. Bassam mm -hmm. is a bereaved uh, Palestinian father. Bassam lost his daughter Abir um, in a shooting outside of her school. And he has been a prominent leader for the Parent Circle ever since. He's been the spokesperson. He has been the co-director. And he is one of the protagonists of the award-winning novel, um, A Paragon. We also have here with us today bereaved Israeli mother, Robbie Damlin, also the spokesperson of the Parent Circle. Robbie lost her son, David, while he was serving in the reserves by a Palestinian sniper. And um, Robbie has, is the protagonist of a documentary called One Day After Peace. And also two um, of my friends. And um, we, what we're planning to do here today, for those of you just joining us, is to have a conversation with the ambassador. You know, the parent circle is all about dialogue. Um, and so that's what we're here to do, is to have a dialogue with our three incredible guests. Um, what we'd like to start with, uh, Ambassador Nides, if you will, you've been in this position for several months now. It must be a whirlwind of a position. If you could tell us what you've been trying to focus on since you began the position and where does um, people to people work um, reconciliation work like the parent circle does, where does that fit into your focus? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, you know, it's, it's just, you know, to, to come on a, a call like this and sit with the leadership that you've assembled and the families who care deeply about reconciliation is, in my view, um, is the highest calling one could do. I, I had a, I've had multiple conversations with Robbie, to be honest with you, I met Robbie through a very close mutual friend of ours and said to me, Tom, you've got to meet someone who is about as remarkable as you can get. And this friend of mine, her name is Mary Zion, does not suffer fools, nor does Robbie. And explained to me that Robbie uh, had a, has a son named David who um, got uh, killed and that she was spending her lifetime trying to bring people together. Not that she wasn't hurt and destroyed by the loss of her son, but felt she would spend her time and her energy better than, than anything is to try to bring people together. And she and I have had a couple of boozy dinners uh, and drank some really good single oh, nights. I can't say that. Sorry, I want to be honest with you. Uh, and you know, it's all about this. And, 
And it is just my honor uh, and a great privilege to spend time with all of you who care deeply about, as I do, about not only reconciliation, but care deeply about people. And this is what this is all about. So I, to, to just explain to you who I am, uh, you know, I'm a, a little Jewish kid from uh, Minnesota, Duluth, Minnesota, in fact. I, was a, I grew up as a reformed Jew um, who basically lit candles on, on Friday night and went to temple a couple times a year. Uh, I, my, I grew up as someone who cared deeply about community and about um, doing the right thing. I, w I wasn't particularly religious. I went to Israel for the first time when I was 14 years old. I slept in the Sinai Desert, climbed Mount Masada, and, and went on the trip because it was free. Uh, and then I've been to uh, Israel, obviously, multiple times uh, since then. And when the opportunity came that the president asked me uh, to do this job, I don't think there could be a better place for one to do an ambassadorship. Not just because of the, of the bond between uh, the state of Israel and America, which I think is, we all know is, is, is ironclad, but the complications in the region. Every day I wake up and I open my mouth or I meet with someone, I aggravate someone else. And every time I try to do something, um, under any circumstances, it's, it's, the, it's we're working in, in a region of the world that has an enormous amount of anxiety and conflict, but we can never give up hope. We can never give up hope. I, um, I spent the last, um, uh, the last couple months, I made a pledge that, um, that I would spend some time going to the shivas of people um, who have been killed in the last uh, month. And what I realized that, you know, it's not just a bunch of Jews who get killed or a bunch of Palestinians who get killed. It's just families that are destroyed. And just destroyed. I went up to, to, uh, uh, up to Tiberias and sat with a family and held their hands as the mother explained to me how her son who was 33 years old, was a kayaker, and got rushed to the scene, rushed to the scene of what was going on. I went to a Druze family um, uh, and, you know, and the Druze, the father explained to me what he and his mother was going through. I was in Tel Aviv yesterday with two families of 27 year olds, 27 years old, the same age as my kid. And I just, it just, it struck me as just this terrifying cycle that um, all of you live with every day. And so my job as an American ambassador is not to give up hope and to emphasize over and over again the importance of uh, the strength of the relationship with Israel, but to make sure no one forgets the single most important thing. We cannot have a strong democratic Jewish state unless we have a two-state solution. And a two-state solution means reconciliation, it means bringing people together, it means taking care of the Palestinian people, it means working together, it means creating programs and ideas and thoughts and doing stuff like this. This is what this is about. And, you know, you can never give up hope. And you can't let, you know, you can't let a very, very, very small percentage of people destroy it for the rest of us. And, you know, it's easy for me to say, and it's much more difficult for families who have lost ones to even talk about reconciliation, but this is what this organization is about. So I am spending my time, um, you know, working uh, on programs, working on trying to make things a little bit better, um, trying to work with, uh, programs that actually make a difference and have a return that shows that we're making some progress. Um, it's hard. I make no mistake. It's very hard. Um, but I think ultimately um, we uh, and the American and this administration uh, is clearly committed to, uh, uh, to peace, to reconciliation, to working together. Uh, and every day I wake up and try to do that. I think people, I get sometimes criticized for caring too much. Uh, but I think the only way you can do this is uh, get in the game, take some risks, be involved, uh, and try to make life better for people both in the West Bank and Gaza and Israel, for, uh, you know, for Arab Israelis, for, for Jewish Israelis, uh, people who live in uh, East Jerusalem and everywhere in between. That's what we need to do, and that's what we're focused on. So long-winded way to say that I'm, uh, it's an enormous honor. This is, I should have gone to Paris. It would have been a lot easier. Uh, but um, we would have had the opportunity to do the parents' stuff. So, okay. Well, we're we're very grateful to have you here, and it's it's 
it's encouraging to hear your focus on the humanity of the conflict because the members of the parent circle are those who have paid the highest price to the conflict. Um, and so what we're focused all the time is on the human cost of the conflict. Robbie, tell us a little bit about you and the cost, the price that you've paid. Well, really, when you look at me, I'm the consequence of this madness. You know, I, I think about it and it, the choice that I took not to die together with my child, but to try to prevent other families from experiencing this pain. And it's difficult, yes, but I always remember what my son told me. One Palestinian killed my child, not the whole Palestinian nation. And if we could only stop comparison of suffering and try to see the humanity in each other and try to understand as Israelis what it's like to live in an occupied place where you have no freedom of movement, which is actually a basic human right, and how we can work together for nonviolence and to understand this basic need for a, a framework for a reconciliation process to be an integral part of any political future peace agreement. Because without that, at best, all we can have is another ceasefire until, this, until the next time. And so I, I cannot thank you enough, Ambassador Knights, for coming and being with us. It's so important that the world can look at, at Israel and Palestine and know that there are people here who have not given up and the cycle of violence that is going on now is just an indication of how difficult it is to maintain your belief all the time. But as you said, we cannot give up, we have to have hope. And, and just watching the transformation in people who join our organization is for me more than anything that as a huge reward for whatever I have done. You're muted, Shiri. And with that, did you, we can start with asking the ambassador. So what we're gonna do today is have a conversation. Um, Robbie and Bassam and the ambassador are gonna be here and, and me and have a conversation. There's a lot of questions coming in in the chat, um, but we have to, we're gonna start first with our questions from Robbie. So, Ambassador Knights, how on earth, if I gave you a magic wand, would you stop this dreadful cycle of violence that is happening now? How would you create that hope in the hearts of Palestinians that they could have a better life? Well, I think what the administration is committed to do, and I think it's showing already by the programs in which we are now engaged in. As you know, um, this administration has uh, dramatically increase the assistance that have been provided by the U.S. government. We're now uh, up to about $450 million as money goes to organizations like UNRWA, which is not perfect, obviously, but organizations are providing education and water and health care. An example of this, I toured the East Jerusalem hospitals uh, yesterday. These hospitals, which are in East Jerusalem, serve 80% of the patients are either from the West Bank or Gaza. These are cancer patients for kids. They're oncology. They're, uh, one of the programs are obviously for infant mortality. Uh, this, these hospitals are just a beautiful thing. And, and they run out of money. You know, a whole variety of reasons why they run out of money. And part of this, the Palestinian Authority um, doesn't have the money to pay or hasn't paid but the United States has the ability to, to step up and help people. This is about people. This isn't about governments. This is not about the governments. Uh, the US government's view of this is quite simple. We need to try to make lives better, both for uh, the Palestinians uh, and uh, those in Israel. And we're trying as hard as we can to do that. And I think ultimately, you know, when I sit with a family, um, uh, in B'nai Brock or sit in the family in Nazareth and, and talk to the parents, which is what this is all about. I, I just, it breaks my heart and I need to understand how we can help. Listen, as you said, 
you know, the one half of 1% of people who do these things, so this very, 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 very small minority cannot ruin it for all the rest of us. We cannot let, you know, we can't let brutality uh, uh, win. So I think that the, to be practical, it's, it's money, it's programs, it's understanding. Listen, um, Secretary Blinken was um, in the West Bank um, last week with, uh, or the week before with President Abbas. Our team here in the US is working with the Palestinian Authority uh, to communicate about things that they need to do as well by helping their people. So we think between focus on a two-state solution, which is very important, because ultimately we can't lose the sight of a, of a two-state solution. And if we do, um, I don't think that's good for the Palestinians and it's certainly not good for the Israelis. So ultimately, I think it is attention, it's money, it's compassion, it's understanding that this, is, this cycle has to end. And we're at a very complicated time right now with Ramadan, Easter, and Passover all in the same month, which only happens once every 10 years. So I'm, we're all holding our breaths, the hope that, the, that this cycle won't spin out of control. And ultimately, um, uh, that is a responsibility for both uh, the Palestinians and, is, and the Israelis. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we want to make sure that everyone uh, does the right thing and keep calm and, and everyone's protected. Thank you. Um, I want to give Bassam, I want to introduce Bassam again. Um, Bassam, thanks for joining us on, on Ramadan. And um, your family has been significantly impacted by this cycle of violence that we've been talking about. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are, your story, how you've been affected by the cycle of violence, and then your question for the ambassador? You know, it's very difficult to talk to politicians because we need to, you know, to make sure that we have the, uh, the right words. Uh, but this is why uh, we are happy that we are not politicians, Mr. Ambassador. So thank you for, for your time to join us. Uh, in fact, it's not a circle of violence, it's an occupation for me. This is what affect my life, my people's life. Uh, at the age of 13, I found myself as a fighter or a warrior without knowing that. And uh, at the end, I have uh, the certificate that I am a terrorist or ex-terrorist sometimes uh, by spending seven years in the Israeli jails when I was 17 years old. Uh, in jail, uh, I learned about myself, uh, uh, about the others, or the, uh, the enemy. Uh, I watched a movie about the Holocaust. We don't know anything about the Holocaust. We don't believe in the Holocaust. So it was very difficult for me to watch this movie. Uh, but after um, around 25 years, uh, I have the chance to make my master's degree about the Holocaust in order to learn more about the other side or the enemy side. Then I understand that if you know more, you act better. You don't know, so you don't know. It's a longer process. I was a co-founder of a group called Combatants for Peace, which is ex-Israeli soldiers and officers who refused to serve the occupation, refused to serve in Palestine because they don't want to be part of this illegal and immoral occupation to another people. And from the Palestinian side, they are ex-prisoners in the Israeli jails. And in 2007, I lost <clears throat> my 10 years old daughter, Abir, to an Israeli border police who shot and killed her from a, a distance of 15 to 20 meters in her head from the back in front of her school. She fell down and two days later, she passed away in Hadassah Hospital. I called this killer as a victim and I said to him that I need you to know that you are a victim and you are not less victim than your victim. Because to kill 10 years innocent girl without even regret, absolutely is a victim. And I said to him, in one day, if you come to ask me to forgive you, I will do because I don't want to take revenge because I don't take revenge from victims. For me, you are not less victim than your victim. But in any day you come to, to ask me to forgive you, I will do because I have another five kids. I don't want them to grow up as victims to you. 
But sometimes it takes decades to discover your humanity and your nobility, so you can see the others as human beings. Uh, unfortunately, it's more than to discover our humanity in each other and to see the humanity in each other. We need to stop this occupation. No one can control another people, so we can live free. And uh, uh, to make it shorter, my question to you, Mr. Ambassador, it's very good that you mentioned that uh, the two-state solution, this is what we look for. Uh, uh, but it's like a joke for the Palestinians when, they, when we say to them, it's two-state solution. They will ask, where is the other state will be, Palestine? Because it's full of settlements. Uh, 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 today, the 22% of the Palestinian land supposed to be the Palestinian state, 60% 60, 60 almost settlements. So where is the other state will be? Which state we are talking uh, about? It means, uh, what's your opinion of uh, frozing the settlements? Well, um, first of all, let me uh, to stop build new settlements in the place where it's supposed to be a Palestinian state. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me, um, you know, you, you, words can't express anything vis-a-vis -vis your loss. So I, as I've said to Robbie, you know, people, you know, ambassador, non-ambassadors, it just, it's impossible. All I can say is my, uh, my heart breaks for your loss and, and obviously your desire to find reconciliation and, and some level of, of peace is obviously enormously important to everyone who's suffered whatever losses they're suffered. So that's first one. Uh, the Biden administration's um, view has been, and obviously I represent the president, uh, is uh, we want a two-state solution. But we want to work towards it. And, and what does that mean? First of all, it means that we, uh, we need to make sure that the conditions on the ground at least allow for a vision, an opportunity for that to get created. And that's not simple to do. Because as we all know, there's a lot of history here for both of, for Israel and the Palestinians uh, of why that hasn't happened over the years. A lot of people have tried, Democrats, Republicans, you know, people I've worked for, people that I've worked against have tried to find the formula to make this work. And, and, I, and I think it is, um, I don't, I, we can't give up hope. Giving up hope is not an option. So the things that we need to focus on, in my humble view, is first of all, um, on the Israeli side, is to make sure that there is a clear view that there's an unbreakable tie with Israel, uh, with the United States, and I represent that because I think it's important at any time for once that it gets people perceive that doesn't uh, exist, the uh, chances of getting to, to, to reconciliation is difficult to do. And two, on the Palestinian side, the position of the administration has been very clear. Um, we do not obviously have supported um, settlement growth. That is a position that the Biden administration has, has had as well as Republican administration has had. So, Ultimately, we believe that we need to keep the conditions on the ground capable and hopefully to allow for, uh, for a two-state solution for the parties to negotiate. And obviously the settlements piece of this is something that has been unbelievably controversial. Again, from the Bush administration to the Reagan administration to the, you know, from the Obama administration, the Biden administration, uh, and even the Trump administration in many cases have been focused on settlement growth and the importance to avoid actions that make the possibility of a two-state solution uh, less availability. So I have been focused on personally, personally on, with the permission of the Biden administration on the Palestinian people. Because ultimately it's about the people. It's about making sure that we have the, the assistance to provide the programs to help the young kids and the mothers and the fathers, which is why I've spent so much time working on things like the East Jerusalem Hospital, working on things like getting 4G to the West Bank, you know, talking about the pension funds and the pension ability. The, 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 you know, let's be clear, you know, 99% or 80% or say, the vast majority of Palestinians wake up every day and want a good job, education for their kids, freedom, you know, security. They want exactly what Israelis want. They don't want anything more or anything less. 
and you know, and I and I think, as you know better than anyone, you know, the you know, we just can't allow that one half of one percent for on, on either side to basically ruin it for the vast majority of people. That's all they want. So my job as the American ambassador is to articulate the position of the Biden administration, which is just that, which is a which is a clear view of a two-state solution, a vision of two-state solution. And it is not easy. I'm, I wish I'd get be able to go into the Rose Garden with the president uh, and sign, you know, the, you know, and get the Nobel Peace Prize. Would that be grand? In the meantime, I am focused on children's health, education, opportunities, freedom, security, and all the things that we need to do to keep this as calm as humanly possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. We we are also focused on people on the ground. As you know, we're especially focused on the role of, of women um, and, the, and the mothers and the sisters and all of the women in the parent circle who have formed a very strong group. Um, and these women um, have had a program for over a decade working towards empowering women to have a stronger role in conflict resolution and peace building and ending the occupation. Um, we have, and we have a, a new project that we're working on that Robbie is very much involved in. Robbie, do you wanna share a little bit about that and ask your next question? Well, I oh, think yeah. I wanted to- I know a lot about this program. I know a lot about this program that Robbie and I have been talking about. So go ahead, Robbie. No, no, I, I think I wanted to make a comment first because I'm reading the chat as you're talking. And it seems to me that it's time that we understood one thing. You're not helping us if you're pro-Israel or you're pro-Palestine. Be a part of the solution. Stop importing our conflict into your country and creating hatred between Muslims, Jews, and having the Christians in the middle. I'm just watching all of the comments and I wish you would be part of the solution. Support people who work, there are so many NGOs. We had a meeting this morning with All Mip, which is a wonderful organization who have or like the daddy body of all of the NGOs because of the situation. And that's when we really need you. And talking about the wedding project is just a small um, pilot for something which is much bigger, because when we spoke and you kindly invited uh, women for women to come to your office and they are planning now to do something on a much bigger scale with Palestinian women. How do you see the role in women in any future peace agreement? Isn't it time to come to the table? Well, let me be clear to you, Robbie, as you know, and I, Robbie and I had this opportunity about two weeks ago where she brought an organization called Women for Women in to see me to talk about the importance of women in this conflict. Um, just to be, I'm a little bit biased as a white Jewish guy from Minnesota, so I'm not sure I'm the best oh. capable of talking about how important women are. But let me be clear, if, if, I, if I was, you know, gone for a day, I would spend the vast, vast, vast majority of our money on, on women, women's programs, conflict resolution with women, ultimately they are the bedrock of whatever conflict resolution we're to get. And again, I don't mean to disrespect the men who are out there, but having been and worked at USAID, support USAID, understand these programs. These, and as Robbie just pointed out, one of the programs, the MEPI program and uh, a, a new program, which is the Neil Lowy Fund, which is a $50 million program a year, which is all about people to people exchanges, which Hopefully those programs will help fund uh, the, the wedding uh, program that uh, Robbie is working on. Also hopefully helping her on the film that she's producing about how important this is, conflict resolution. Um, we are, you know, we are needing to put our money where our mouth is and support these programs through these people to people programs. It is about Jews seeing with Palestinians. It's about, you know, Jewish families understanding uh, the conflict, understanding the pain, it's Palestinian families understanding the anger that people have. It's about people understanding each other. And, and again, um, the more we spend our resources and energy on this, in my humble view, the better off we will be. It is not perfect. It is not perfect. And I understand the anger and the conflict. And we can either give up and just go into our corners and spend no energy and money and concerns and focus, 
or we can get into the game, which is what the family circle, you know, is, you know, the, this, this organization is what this is. It's getting in the game, getting into debate uh, and, and not giving up. And, you know, every day it would be a lot easier for me as the American ambassador uh, to Israel is to spend very little time worrying about the, the situation in the West Bank and Gaza. And I refuse to do that. I refuse to do that. I, I think it's important for Israel to say as a democratic Jewish state that we have a vision of a two-state solution. I've said it over and over and over again. And, and it, if you basically throw up your hands and, and decide you're not going to do that, it's not going to help Israel. It's certainly not going to help, help the Palestinian people. Uh, and that's what I'm willing to do. I literally, not only, I talk about it's having spent a bunch of time trying to help raise the money for the uh, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem Hospital, but I'm trying to get U.S. companies to move into the West Bank, to open operations in the West Bank, to push folks to get the technology that they need to make the life for average Palestinians better. Because ultimately, that's the, that hope is what we're about. Um, it's not perfect. It's not, I'm not dreamy. I'm not a dreamy guy. I'm a practical guy. I try to look for practical solutions. And just like this organization does every day, uh, is to try to find practical things we can do. So the programs that you all are doing here, the programs that Robbie's doing uh, about reconciliation, but education and opportunities is what we're trying to do. The Biden administration is trying to do every day. And, and again, we, we can judge ourselves on success or failure and that'll play for other people to decide, but at least we're focused on the right things in our view. Thank you, Robbie. Also some people, have thanked you in the chat for saying what you said about not importing our Israeli-Palestinian conflict and being pro-solution. So thank you for saying that. Um, well, they're also, also very sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's very important to look at the campuses in America and in the United Kingdom and to see just exactly how this conflict is being imported into their campuses and how frightening that is. And so the parent circle also will spend and does spend part of the tours that we take to the United States and to the United Kingdom on campuses, talking to Jewish and Muslim students, because probably half of them couldn't even find Israel or Palestine on a map. But it's so easy to take sides. It just makes you feel good about yourself. And when we were talking about the series that we are making or trying to make, hopefully, um, it, it's about reconciliation because people say, what are you talking about? Peace isn't even vaguely on the table and you're talking about reconciliation. But the fact is that if we don't prepare something in advance, then when you stand on the White House again and sign that paper, will the people of Israel and Palestine be ready to look into each other's eyes and admit crimes that had happened and look at each other as human beings and apologize for things that have happened in the past. There's a lot of questions coming in um, about the US consulate. Bassam, do you wanna talk a little bit about how this has affected the closing of the conflict as, of the consulate has affected you and why it's important and ask your next yeah. question? In fact, yes, this is what I want to ask you uh, for, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, when do you think that uh, the, uh, this uh, administration will reopen the uh, American Council in East Jerusalem? And you know the, uh, the effect, how it's important for the Palestinians to see or to try to see the Americans as honest broker between the Israelis and the Palestinians and to stop the same policy since the last, as you know, four years with the Trump administration. Uh, at the same time, do you think we will uh, reopen the uh, uh, PLO office uh, in Washington, D.C. again? Uh, well, let me just answer the question of the consulate. Um, the Secretary of State and the President have said uh, for, for the last, you know, since he's become President, he has every desire to open of the consulate, and we're in constant contact uh, and discussions with the Israeli government. Uh, two, I think it's you know it's really important that the ability for the United States to basically work on programs that directly assist the Palestinian people 
is as important as any possible policy decisions that we can make. And given the fact of, again, I don't do politics anymore because I'm an ambassador now. However, obviously it's probably not lost to anyone that the previous administration's ability to fund uh, programs uh, in the West Bank and Gaza was dramatically limited. And we have done what since the Biden has come into office, gone from basically almost zero money uh, to almost a half a billion dollars, and that number will go up uh, next year, uh, to work with programs such as the, you know, uh, this organization and the programs that Robbie is doing and many, many, many more programs. I have sat down for hundreds and hundreds of hours trying to figure out how we can create programs that will actually help uh, those who are living uh, in places like Ramallah, have run in places that need the assistance to provide opportunities. And so that's what we're spending, we're focusing our attention on. Uh, we have a, a very large uh, staff that works on, in Jerusalem, works on those issues. Uh, and we're gonna continue pushing forward as much as we can uh, to effectively help people's lives. Ambassador, you talked a lot about um, hope in the past 40 minutes or so. Um, we talk a lot about hope too, because really that's what we're parent circle is here to provide. Um, the programs on the ground that we run are um, work directly to bring Israelis and Palestinians together, which you know is no small uh, miracle these days. Um, we're up against so many barriers, even before we get to the fear and the hate and the, and the anger. Um, we have to go through hoops to get permits and um, get Palestinian uh, venues to not feel like they're part of anti-normalization for hosting us. And I mean, there's just a myriad of logistical on the ground challenges. And so hope sometimes gets brushed under the rug um, I'd love for the three of you to spend some time sharing with us about where you get your source of hope from. Like you, you wake up every day in the morning, where do you get your sources of hope? Robbie, Bassam, Ambassador Knights. Who first? <laughs> Ladies Ladies. first. So they Age were before the beauty, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The dust before the broom. Um, you know, I look at my life and I'm terribly grateful and hopeful when I can meet a mother who has come to the parent circle after the loss of a child and has never had really the opportunity to tell her story. And suddenly she talks about her story and tells people what happened and how much blood there was, and it's all very logistic, but slowly and slowly, the more opportunity she has to tell her story, suddenly she starts to talk about the person that died, and that's healing, and the next step in healing. And can you imagine what a privilege it is to be a catalyst in somebody's life for them to go through transformation from hatred and looking for revenge to understanding how important it is to preserve the lives of our children and grandchildren and to stop the violence. And to see a woman who told me in the, in the very first meeting that I, if she meets the man after a hundred years who killed her son, she'd kill him. But today she's one of the leaders in the women's group. So how can I tell you that I can't have hope? And besides, we don't have the luxury of giving up hope. I look into the eyes of my grandchildren and they must know that I have done everything possible to stop this madness. Yes, sir. You know, for, for me, uh, uh, our hope, our belief in peace, we come from our humanity, our values, our education. Always I said, we are praying. The Muslims, we pray five times a day, as long as we survive. And in each prayer, we say the same words, and each time you never give up. You enjoy every prayer. And this is exactly what we are doing to spread our message that we can use our pain in a different way, not always for revenge. And revenge 
It's not always to kill. We can take revenge in a different way. To prove to the killer that we are all belong to the mankind, we are human beings. It's very easy to lose our humanity and to act in a very brutal way. And it's very easy also to rediscover our humanity and to see each other as human beings. And always I said that the Palestinians didn't kill 6 million Israelis. And the Israelis didn't kill 6 million Palestinians until now. And there is a German ambassador in Tel Aviv. And there is an Israeli ambassador in Berlin. It means the level of hatred and the blood, it didn't arrive to this level. So we just need a brave leader to take us towards the future and to release us from the very painful past. We can talk about the Holocaust another 73 years. We can talk about the Nakba another 73 years, but we will never improve the past. It's over. Let us look forward for our kids and for our peoples and for our family. We need to share this land as one state or two states or five states. Otherwise, we will share it as the two big graves to our kids, our families, and our people. Our lives is more important than any land and than any holy stones. So it's a fact. In one day, we will have peace. But we don't know how much blood we need to cook the conditions, to sign the same agreement, to release us from our fear, and to let us live together in the future. You know, I, I remember when I came to Israel, I mean, if you would have told me then after I grew up um, fighting the apartheid system, and if you would have told me then that blacks and whites would actually sit together in the same room and not want to kill each other, I probably would have said you were mad. But looking at South Africa, which is not now the ideal stay, uh, country in the world, but yet if we consider what happened in South Africa and the fact that they had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the fact that they didn't have a bloodbath, that should give us hope as well. Ambassador Nines, do you want to share your source of hope? You've talked a lot about hope, both having hope yourself and giving hope to others. First of all, you know, I'm sort of not worthy in this, you know, with, with the people who are have lost someone. So, you know, for me to in any way try to articulate something given what you guys have been through is it's kind of speechless for me. Um, I guess I can only say when I when I was in um, Tel Aviv um, Thursday and I was holding the hand of this kid, of the 27 year old who was shot 48 hours before and I was holding the hand of his fiance. It just got engaged three weeks earlier. And I didn't see hatred in her eyes. I didn't, I, I didn't see like, you know, she was, sad and hurt and destroyed in many ways. What I didn't see in her eyes was like revenge and, and you know, painting everyone with the same brush and calling everyone. It just, I didn't, I didn't see it. And I guess, again, I'm not worthy of, of discussing what hope means or doesn't mean, but I, I sat with her for, you know, for a while, and I guess it's my, I guess my view is if, if she still has hope, um, how can I not have hope? And so again, I, I don't know all the answers. Not, just, this is a imperfect situation on all the sides, uh, but I gotta have hope because I think the vast, vast, vast majority of Palestinians and Israelis wanna live in peace, want opportunities, wanna have a good life, uh, and, you know, and the programs such as this, hopefully, you know, sends that message to people. So um, that gives me hope. Yeah, and, and that it gives me hope, too. And it gives all of our participants, not just today, but all the people in Israel and Palestine that we speak to on a daily basis. You know, we speak in Israeli schools. We speak in Palestinian communities. We run a narrative, pro dual narrative project. 
Um, we have a summer camp for Israeli and Palestinian youth. We run a, a ton of projects and, and what you just said rings true in all of those projects that if these people like Robbie and Bassam have paid the highest price and can stand together and call for seeing the humanity in the other side, if they can stand there and, and say that, then anyone should be able to. Any of the people in the chat, any of the people here today, you know, if Rabi and Bassam, who have paid a very dear price to the occupation um, and, and, the, and the violence, then, then we should all be able to. And, and not only that, it's not only about hope, but it's about responsibility because once we hear these messages, once we hear these stories, we have a responsibility to Rabi and to Bassam and to the people they lost, to David and to Abir, that to, to carry on, to promote these messages, to share it with other people, to go out and tell at least five other people today uh, about the work of the parent circle. And, and I hope you'll do that. Um, Ambassador, I, I know we have just a little bit time of time left. I know you are used to being sort of grilled with questions, and I, if, I, if the examples in the chat or anything of them, I'd love to give you a little reprieve from that and and ask you if there's anything you would like to ask of Rabi and Bassam. Let you do some of the asking for once. Well, you know, it's interesting. I um. You know, what I need, we need, I think the US government needs to understand is what programs that really work. You know, um, what really works? What works in the field? I mean, Bassam and, uh, and Robbie are, are, you know, are in the, they're in the muck. They're in the daily, you know, when, you, when Robbie comes up with an idea to, to basically create a, a, you know, a wedding event planning company, <laughs> That understands what entrepreneurs that works. That works. What are the programs that work? What are the things that give people hope and opportunity? That's what the United, that's what this Biden administration is trying to do. How do we find things that can that can help help the conflict, bring peace, bring reconciliation? Um, so I need we need concrete stuff. I'm a very practical guy, right, guys? I, I you know I it's impossible for me listening to Bassam and having spent some time with Robbie, not to be just, you know, my, not, it's, it's not just about my heart going out. That's kind of, everyone says that. It's just, I, I, want, I'm at, I want to do action. And we, and I think this administration through, you know, people like Samantha Powers who runs USAID and the, the men and women who work at our embassy uh, and work day and night, they really care. They really care. We're not perfect. We don't do everything right. We get ourselves in trouble. We say things, don't say things. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I started this conversation by saying the importance of, of uh, an unbreakable bond um, uh, with um, uh, with Israel. It's also an unbreakable bond with the Palestinian people. Um, you know, we we support the Palestinian people. We, we want opportunities and hope for them. So, what I'd love to hear from those guys is what really works. And that would be helpful uh, to me. You know what, Shiri, you spoke about hope. And I was just thinking to myself, lately at the schools, we've had a lot of flack from certain members of the opposition of the government of Israel, who've taken it upon themselves to try to stop us from talking to children in school, 17 year olds. And I suddenly remembered all the Palestinians from our group, and it's not just Bassam and I, there are 600 families and we could have had this, this webinar with 600 amazing stories. And I think about the Palestinians that get up at four o'clock in the morning and come through the checkpoint to the schools while people are standing outside and screaming at them and calling them terrorists and how brave they are. How could I not have hope after something like that? And, and do you want to respond to the ambassador's question? You'd be on the... What works? You you guys have both been in the parent circle doing this work on Maybe the ground. What works? What, what works? For works some? What works for Ruby is different <laughs> for me. Okay. Uh, but as as the parent circle, of course, there are a lot of things. You know, for me, I have a dream that one day, very soon, uh, United States of America will recognize Palestine as a state. Then we will solve all this 
put an end to 75 years of conflict and they will see us, both of us as human beings, then it's not uh, uh, for money at all when we talk about politics, what the Palestinians want. They want freedom. They want to be safe, exactly as you described, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, but for us, of course, it's to, to support uh, projects that we did people to people for the new generations. Uh, I know that there are a higher uh, commission, uh, American, Israeli, Palestinian for education, for example. And they never meet because the Israelis refuse. This is what I know. In order to discuss the school box, the escalation, the asata. Uh, so we need to start a new education for the new generations to start to see the, uh, the ability that in one day, maybe we can make peace together. Maybe we can live together, not like Oslo agreement. When it happened, it was suddenly. And it's fell down because we are not involved as a grassroots, as people. We are not, we are not there. So this is what we want to be to start to prepare, as Robbie said, for a reconciliation process to be an integral part of any peace uh, agreement, future peace agreement. Uh, uh, of course, you can help us just to be with us like today. Thank you. You give us international stage who support us, as you consider as a friend to the parent circle, a friend to our uh, message for uh, peace and reconciliation is possible. And this is the evidence. We are together. We can live together, both side by side. So uh, uh, always I said the biggest support, what uh, Martin Luther King says, that in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Please don't keep silence, and you can help us. Thank you, Bassam. Robbie, do you want to also respond to the question? What works? I think we proved what works in the work that we do every day, because more and more people hear this message, and that's the most important thing. And if you can just get three students who are going to the army to understand that when they stand at a checkpoint and they see a grandfather, with his grandson that they should treat him with respect. And how amazing it is at times for soldiers standing at the checkpoint to suddenly recognize one of the Palestinians from our group who'd been into their classroom. So, you know, there are so many things to say. The things to say are to stop the violence or to try to find a way to make that emotional breakthrough. And maybe even dare I say it, to love. Mm. Thank you, Robbie. Um, you say that our, we, we've proven what works, Ambassador, our program, bringing Israelis and Palestinians together, um, showing the human side of the other, engaging in dialogue, having people have the chance to just explain who they are, see each other, form bonds, see each other as human beings. The dehumanization of the Israelis and Palestinians is what justifies sort of any action. When you don't see the other side as human beings, then you can do anything to them. So um, our programs work. A lot of other people, people organizations, bringing Israelis and Palestinians, overcoming incredible obstacles to make that happen, th those programs work. I wanna thank you all for being here with us today. I wanna to thank the ambassador for joining us, not only for joining us ambassador, but really from speaking from your heart because your heart, I know you're all about action, but your heart leads to your actions. And so we're grateful for that. And for Robbie and Bassam for always being such inspirational leaders and speakers um, and for reminding us what it is we're really um, dealing with in all between all of the headlines and, and the news articles um, and, and propaganda that we hear every day. This is what it's all about. Thank you all for joining us, Ambassador Nye. Yes, my dear. Can we please tell everybody about the ceremony? We forgot. Yes, yes, we didn't number yet. On the 3rd of May, um, 
we, the Israeli and Palestinian Joint Memorial Day Ceremony, Ambassador Knives, you're of course invited. This is a Memorial Day ceremony that we hold every year um, on Yom, Israel's Yom Zikaron. Um, the joint ceremony shed says that the pain is a shared pain, the pain of loss, of losing someone, whether you're Palestinian or Israeli, is the same thing. And that doesn't have to be um, an act of fate. There is a way to stop it. And, and so we hope you'll join us. It's at 8.30 uh, Jerusalem time on May 3rd, it's live streaming. You can watch it on um, the Parent Circle's Facebook page. Oh, Christopher just put a link in the chat. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I encourage everybody to register and to tune in on that day. If there is any day that is um, of the most importance to the parent circle, that is, that is the day when we remember all of those who lost their lives, Israelis and Palestinians, to this needless conflict. Thank you so much. Thank you. And in this note, I want to invite uh, Mr. Ambassador to my uh, modest house in Jerusalem, in, in, uh, not in Jerusalem, in Jericho, but without Roby. <laughs> <laughs> Any time. Thank, thank you all very much. I'm honored. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.